name is Ryan Paul, and I teach history here on campus, and I'm also the director of Apex. Uh, and on behalf of the Apex team and myself and the Apex team, Amelia Nauman and Sophie Javage, I want to welcome you to Joseph Smith for President, A Portrait of American Descent. I'd also like to thank the Eccles Visiting Scholar Fund and the Provost's Office for making this event possible. I'd like to remind you that our conversation will continue today at 3 o'clock on Thunder 91.1 and on the Apex Radio podcast. Spencer McBride is the author of multiple books on religion and American politics. McBride's writing discusses the evolving role of religion in American political culture. His writing has been featured in publications such as the Washington Post, Deseret News, and several scholarly journals, as well as a variety of podcasts. His works include Pulpit and Nation, Clergymen and the Politics of Revolutionary America, Contingent Citizens, Shifting Perspectives of Latter-day Saints in American Political Culture, and Joseph Smith for President, The Prophet, The Assassins, and the Fight for American Religious Freedom. McBride sets out to prove how religion and politics intersect and how separate but similar they can be. As a side note, we do have copies of Joseph Smith for President for purchase in the lobby, and Dr. McBride will host a book signing after his presentation. Dr. McBride is currently an Associate Managing Historian of the Joseph Smith Papers Project based in Salt Lake City, Utah. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Spencer McBride to Southern Utah University and to the APEX stage. Good morning. It is good to be with you. It's good to be here in Cedar City. Um, I'm thankful to, to Professor Paul and to all that work in the APEX, the APEX team for the invitation. Um, for the Southern Utah University for having me and for hosting me and for all of you guys for being here so we can talk about something we're told not to talk about in polite company, religion and politics. Right? This, this conversation is not appropriate for Thanksgiving table conversation if you want an enjoyable meal. But I'm going to begin this, this talk about Joseph Smith's 1844 presidential campaign by invoking one of my favorite authors, Charles Dickens. And that might seem like a weird thing to do, but if you bear with me, I promise it will make sense, okay? So Charles Dickens wrote what, in my opinion, is one of the best opening lines of a novel ever. Think for a second if you know what that is. Now, some of you might be thinking it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I mean, that's pretty good too, I guess. But my personal favorite comes from A Christmas Carol. It's a book my family read um, aloud to each other every single year at Christmas time when I was growing up. And Charles Dickens opens that novel like this. Marley was dead to begin with. That's it. That's the opening line. And then he spends three paragraphs to tell you just how dead Jacob Marley was. Does anyone remember he was as dead as a... Doornail. That's how dead Jacob Marley was. That's a long time to spend at the beginning of a novel telling us that Jacob Marley was actually dead. But then Charles Dickens comes to the point. He says that Marley being dead must, quote, be distinctly understood if anything wonderful is to come from the story I'm about to relate. And so as a historian, when I write, when I speak, I often think to myself, what fact must be distinctly understood by you if anything wonderful is to come from the story I'm about to relate? You guys ready for it? This is that fact. Prior to the American Civil War and the adoption of the 14th Amendment, the Bill of Rights did not apply to the individual states. I'll say that again because it's really important. Before the Civil War and the adoption of the 14th Amendment, the federal government could not enforce the Bill of Rights on the individual states. Now, this used to be a well-known fact in our civic mind, our collective civic mind. But it seems to be forgotten, either willfully or perhaps a symptom of our society's ever-worsening case of historical amnesia. 
this fact has been forgotten. But it matters immensely, and it matters immensely to the story. I got ahead of myself by pressing that button there. So what this meant was that the federal government could not enforce those individual rights protected in the Bill of Rights, those first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Um, and this was in part part of the American political tradition when the framers of the Constitution adopted the, uh, the, the Bill of Rights in Congress. They did so with a mind very much informed by the Revolution where they had fought the power of a distant parliament, a distant king. And they said the rights of the people are better protected by state governments as opposed to a quote unquote distant federal government. But it wasn't just tradition, it was also legal precedence. In 1833, in the Supreme Court case Barron v. Baltimore, the Supreme Court ruled specifically the Bill of Rights does not apply to the individual states. And then in 1845, it got even more specific and said that the freedom of religion clause specifically does not apply to the individual states, that Congress could not enforce freedom of religion in individual states. Okay, so that's like, you know, the equivalent of three paragraphs of Marley was dead, how dead was he? Uh, I, I think we got it, right? The Bill of Rights did not apply to the individual states prior to the American Civil War. Why does that matter? Because when Joseph Smith ran for president, the primary reason he ran for president was constitutional reform on this very point. And so my topic today then is about this little known presidential campaign of Joseph Smith in 1844 that had little to no chance of succeeding. Um, and his campaign was run outside the two party system. It's what today we would call a third party campaign. Um, back then they called it an independent campaign and Joseph Smith an independent candidate. And in the history of the United States, we have had dozens and dozens and dozens of third party presidential bids. And in that long history, not a single one has come remotely close to winning the presidency. The closest would be Theodore Roosevelt in 1912, but there's like a huge asterisk next to that because he had already been president two times. Let me give you a few examples to show just how difficult it is to be a third party candidate. Eugene Debs ran for president in 1904, 1908, 1912, and 1920 as a candidate for the Socialist Party of America. In 1912, he got as close as he would ever get to winning when he won nearly one million votes. But that amounted to only 6% of the American electorate. <laughs> Similar campaigns were run with even less success um, by Ralph Nader in uh, 1972, 1980, 1992, 1996, 2000, and 2008. And many of you might remember Ross Perot, who famously played spoiler in the presidential elections of 1992 and 1996 as the candidate of the Reform Party. And I'd have to double check this. I think he got up to 13% of the vote. That's as high as he got. And I'm only beginning to scratch the surface of this long history of third party campaigns in American history. And so why do they matter though? Because even in the present, whenever we have a, third, whenever we have a presidential election and there's a third party candidate, Americans enter into the exact same debate every single time. That is this going to draw away the vote from one candidate or another? Is this candidate going to be spoiler? Or maybe at best, this third party candidate can move the platform of one of the two major parties to the right or to the left. But other than that, there's a defeatist mentality in the way we talk about third party campaigns. Now, I'm not here to advocate for or against third party campaigns, but instead to ask the question, what is their historical significance beyond whether or not they could have won? And for me, as a historian, I look at third party cam campaigns with fascination because despite their bleak prospects for electoral success, they provide an invaluable lens to us to view and understand the discontent 
a certain segment of the American population feels with the status quo at any given time. At any given time, when people support a third party candidate, they are expressing some form of discontent with the status quo, with the mainstream system. And this, these campaigns, even though they have no chance of success, at least not yet, help us understand why some Americans are so disillusioned with the system we have in place. And so as you know, I wrote a book about Joseph Smith's presidential campaign. And one of my goals in this book was to argue why it shouldn't be relegated in history to a fun fact or to a trivia, like, did you know Joseph Smith ran for president? But instead to ask the question, what was the discontent? What was the disillusionment that was driving Joseph Smith and his supporters to launch a long shot presidential bid outside the main uh, two party system that existed in the country? And that's where we come back to this idea of the Bill of Rights not applying to the individual states. Why did the Latter-day Saints and Joseph Smith care so much about it? But then the bigger question, why should people who don't care about Joseph Smith care about this campaign that had no chance of winning? And the question of constitutional reform and of discontent with the way the Constitution was working is at the heart of this story. So, Joseph Smith's entry into American politics happened almost by necessity. Uh, as many of you will know that the story of the early Latter-day Saints is one fraught with persecution, often violent. And in 1838, things boiled over into an outright war between uh, the Missouri State Militia and uh, mobs comprised of vigilantes uh, and, and their Mormon neighbors in northern Missouri. This led to the destruction of Mormon property, the burning of Mormon homes, the rape of Latter-day Saint women, and in some cases, the death of Latter-day Saint men. And when the Latter-day Saints appealed to the governor of the state for help, the governor responded instead with what became known as the Exterminating Order, where in an official state document, he declared that the Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state to preserve the peace. Essentially, a forced exodus under threat of state-sanctioned extermination. Well, in November 1839, the Latter-day Saints were rebuilding their lives in Nauvoo, Illinois, as uh, refugees from the state of Missouri. And Joseph Smith ventures to Washington, D.C. with some of his trusted friends to petition for redress and reparations. And in November 1839, he gets an audience with the President of the United States, Martin Van Buren. These were the days where you could go and knock on the White House door, and the President would hold receptions every weekday afternoon, and you could get an audience with him. I don't suggest trying that these days. I think security is a little more heightened there now. And Joseph sits down with the President and explains what has happened, and asks the President, essentially, in his State of the Union address, or what they then called the Addressed Congress, to take up the cause of redress and reparations for the Mormons who lost their property uh, in Missouri. And President Martin Van Buren reads the letters of recommendation, reads their petition, and says, quote, what can I do? I can do nothing for you. If I do anything, I will come in contact with the State of Missouri, essentially saying, I'm up for re-election uh, in, in 1840. If I come out in favor of you, I will lose the state of Missouri. And the state of Missouri is one of the only states that's like firmly in my column. Uh, and, and so I don't know if Martin Van Buren had any prejudice toward the Latter-day Saints, but in this moment, it was a decision made of political calculus that he was not willing to stick his neck out in defense of this religious minority group. And so, Joseph Smith turns his attention to Congress, and they draft a petition, and they get hundreds of signed affidavits from Latter-day Saints who were expelled from Missouri, itemizing every lost piece of property in that war. And then they ask Congress uh, in this 27-page memorial for $2 million in reparations. Congress, uh, the United States Senate, 
sends the petition to the Judiciary Committee, and they have a special hearing on this Missouri war. And ultimately, they decide that the federal government has no jurisdiction, that this is a state issue, and that the Bill of Rights does not apply to the individual states. Remember that fact I told you that was as important as Marley being dead? See, I told you it would start to make sense. Okay, so Joseph Smith then goes home really disappointed, very frustrated with Van Buren, with Congress, and with the entire kind of political system. He truly believed that if he went to Washington, right? If I told myself I wouldn't make this pun, but if Mr. Smith went to Washington with these affidavits, with these petitions, that they would see the merits of his cause and that they would take their side. But he was perhaps naively unaware of the hardball politics that are played in the halls of the Capitol building. And they were not willing to take their side on merit alone. So Joseph Smith and the Latter-day Saints, they continue to petition Congress every single year. They send another petition for redress and reparations, and it never gets as far as it got in 1839 and 1840. And so they continue to build their kind of safe haven on the banks of the Mississippi River in a town called Nauvoo, Illinois, primarily populated by Latter-day Saint refugees. But as they grow larger and larger and more prosperous and more prosperous, tensions with their non-Latter-day Saint neighbors continue to escalate. And by January 1844, it appears that what had happened in Missouri is about to happen again, now in Illinois. And so Joseph Smith and other church leaders meet together on a frigid January morning in 1844 to talk about the presidential election and what candidate that they would support. A couple months earlier, they wrote letters to each of the five men um, expected to run for president. John C. Calhoun, Lewis Cass, Richard Mentor Johnson, Martin Van Buren, and Henry Clay. And the letter said the same thing to each man. What would be your course of action toward us as a people if you were elected president? Essentially, the Latter-day Saints are saying, if you say that you will support us and help us, you have our vote. Now, they were a minority group, but in the state of Illinois, they were large enough that they played kingmaker. They were a big enough minority that if they voted for the Whig candidate or the Democratic candidate, that candidate would win the electoral votes of Illinois. And in a close election, that mattered a lot. Well, Van Buren never responded, neither did his former vice president, Richard Mentor Johnson. John C. Calhoun responded, though. And he said, I sympathize with you, I feel for you, but I don't think the federal government should be able to help you he invoked instead the doctrine of states' rights. And then uh, Lewis Cass wrote essentially the same letter, and Joseph Smith would write a very public letter back, castigating both men, declaring the states' rights doctrines are what feed mobs. Joseph Smith called them, quote, a stink offering in the nose of Jehovah, and that Congress with the president as, as its executor should be as almighty in its sphere as, quote, Jehovah is in his. Joseph Smith was not taking the state's rights doctrine as reason for religious minorities to suffer uh, at the hands of persecutors. But then Henry Clay wrote a letter that, in my opinion, made Joseph Smith even more mad. Because Calhoun and Cass, they gave a principled reason for not wanting to help the Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith disagreed with the principle, but at least there was a principle. Henry Clay perhaps wanted to be president more than any person in American history has ever wanted to be president. He ran five times. And he writes a letter that essentially, to paraphrase, goes like this. I sympathize with you, I feel for you, but I don't want to make any promises on the campaign trail that I will be expected to keep in office. And this really irks Joseph Smith because... I mean, like, have a spine, right? Like, say that you stand for something, even if we disagree with what you stand for. And so by that frigid January 1844 morning, Joseph Smith and other leaders in Nauvoo meet, 
to discuss who are we going to support. None of these men are willing to help us. And in this moment of desperation, they decide to nominate Joseph Smith as a third party or independent candidate for president. And very quickly, Joseph gets to work putting together a presidential pamphlet, a presidential platform in the form of a pamphlet called General Smith's Views on the uh, Powers and Policy of the Government of the United States. Now, Joseph Smith was a one, uh, there was one issue that, sorry, I think, I think there's an incident in the, okay, I will continue, sorry. Um, Joseph, one issue drove Joseph Smith into the presidential election, but he wasn't a one-issue candidate. Um, he put together a platform that called for correcting many of the social ills that he saw in society. Um, for instance, he called for the immediate abolition of slavery, or at least by the year 1850 that slavery should be abolished completely in the United States. But his plan to do it was very unique. He claimed that the best way to free uh, enslaved men, women, and children and to end the institution of slavery was for the federal government to purchase the freedom of every enslaved man, woman, and child. And so all the, all the proceeds that were coming from the sale of public lands in the Western United States, the federal government could then take that money and purchase every enslaved person's freedom, thereby ending the institution. Paid emancipation was not a new concept. Joseph Smith was the first to propose it on a national level, that we end slavery by simply purchasing the freedom of every enslaved person. He called for prison reform. This was a time when large penitentiaries were a new feature in American society. And Joseph Smith lamented that they were causing more harm than good. He saw the prison system, the criminal justice system, as creating a permanent criminal class in the United States rather than reforming men and women who had been convicted of crimes. That prison should reform more than it punishes. He also called for uh, the establishment of a new national bank as the United States continued to go through uh, moments of severe boom and bust uh, without a strong federal regulation of the economy. And he called for the territorial expansion of the United States into the Oregon country and the annexation of Texas. And he says eventually the United States should expand to include Canada and Mexico as well, all of North America. And then he called for the shrinking of the size of the federal government. He had been to Congress. He was unimpressed with the way men and women behaved uh, in, in the uh, Capitol and that the men charged with running the country acted in the halls of, of Congress. So he called for shrinking the size of the federal government, even as he called for expanding the federal government's power. So he had this long list of reforms to take care of the marginalized in society. Um, but at the core of his presidential campaign was constitutional reform. The federal government should be empowered to protect minority groups when states fail to do so. He wasn't looking to take away all state power, but instead to empower a federal government to uh, protect minorities when states did not do so. And so, by February, Joseph Smith had his campaign platform ready. He had it published, and his campaign was ready to launch. Now, in 1844, Joseph Smith had something that most third-party candidates did not. He had a group of hundreds of experienced missionaries who knew how to travel the country without person script and to preach the gospel. Now he employed those missionaries to go out, more than 400, and canvass the, the, the entire country with this political pamphlet almost as a tract and to campaign for Joseph Smith's can, um, election as president of the United States. They sent this platform to the president, to every member of the president's <laughs> cabinet, to every justice on the Supreme Court, to the... Um, to, prominent members of the United States Senate and the House of Representatives, and they sent missionaries 
with this pamphlet in hand. And, and they met with various success. Some of these stories of these electionarian missionaries are fascinating. Like, I love the one from Boston. And is anyone here from Boston? Oh, good, I can tell this story then without fear of reprisal. So there is a, a electionary campaign meeting for Joseph Smith in Boston, and hecklers show up. Shocker, right? And they start heckling these campaign missionaries. The police are called, and a fight breaks out, not between the Latter-day Saints and their hecklers. The hecklers start fighting and brawling with the police themselves. And the campaign meeting has to be stopped and resumed the next morning. Um, then in um, uh, Tennessee, electionary missionaries are surrounded by mobs, not because they're Latter-day Saints. They are surrounded by mobs because they're distributing a pamphlet that calls for the end of slavery. And in the state of Tennessee at this time, it was illegal to distribute anti-slavery literature. And so the Latter-day Saint electionary missionaries were surrounded by a mob and eventually let go once they promised to leave what copies they had and not distribute them anymore in the state of Tennessee. But this campaign continues, looking forward to November and Election Day. Now, any discussion of this curious, even quixotic campaign leads to the question, was he serious? Was Joseph Smith serious about running for president? Or was this merely a publicity stunt, a way of getting attention to the plight of Latter-day Saints in 19th century America? And the answer to that is, yes, Joseph Smith was serious. But he, the Latter-day Saints were not putting all their eggs in one basket. They were not pinning all their hopes on Joseph Smith becoming president. It would seem that many understood just how unlikely it would be that he would win. But if we look at what else they were doing at the time that Joseph Smith was running for president, we get a better picture of how this long shot presidential bid fits into the bigger problem the Latter-day Saints were facing. At the same time Joseph Smith is running for president, the city of Nauvoo petitions Congress to make Nauvoo a federal city like Washington, D.C. Essentially, under this plan, the city of Nauvoo was to secede from the state of Illinois and be under federal direction. This would work because it meant that, uh, it meant that they got around the state's rights doctrine that prevented federal uh, protection. And with this, uh, they believed that if mobs came against them, they could call the federal government. The federal government could not say, we can't do anything because of state's rights. So while Joseph Smith's running for president, while Joseph Smith and, and the city of Nauvoo are, are petitioning to become a federal city, the city council of Nauvoo also petitions to make Joseph Smith a general in the United States Army, which would then give him command of troops that he could direct to protect the saints in Nauvoo should mobs come against them. Again, the common theme is the state's rights doctrine is what's preventing the federal government from protecting us as a minority group. Um, this then will uh, get us around that obstacle. At the same time, Joseph Smith's running for president and that they're petitioning to make Nauvoo a federal city and they're petitioning to make Joseph Smith a general in the army. This is kind of like the 12 days of Christmas, right? The list can get longer and longer. The Latter-day Saints petitioned Congress for a liberal tract of land in the Western territories, some place like the Great Basin, where they could live uh, in peace and practice their religion without any, any others to harass them or persecute them. And even as they're looking for all these ways to stay in the United States, they have to consider leaving the United States as well. And so in 1844, while all these other petitions are, petitions are in play, and while Joseph Smith is running for president, they enter into negotiations with the president of the Republic of Texas, Sam Houston, for the Latter-day Saints to come and occupy what's known as the Noasis Strip, this uh, contested uh, piece of land be uh, in the southern border of Texas and Mexico between the Noasis and Rio Grande River, uh, Mexico claimed it was theirs. Texas claimed it was theirs. It, that dispute was going to be settled by who has settlers there. And the Latter-day Saints were a good option for Sam Houston because they came with their own militia. 
the Nauvoo Legion. So all these irons were on the fire. The presidential campaign was just one of them. And it really helps us see the plight of religious minorities in 19th century America. Sometimes all you could do is throw whatever legal challenge you could against the wall and see what stuck. And if we understand the primary motive of Joseph Smith's presidential campaign, the question of could he win or not, or was he serious, uh, makes a little more sense when we see they are just desperate to get around the systemic inequality of the country. Joseph Smith would say again and again that he loved the country. He loved the Constitution, but it was falling short. And this is a fascinating point. Joseph Smith was not a great legal scholar. He was not um, somebody who studied the Constitution in depth. But his lived experience said there is something wrong in the country if we as a minority group can be treated this way and the government says there's nothing we can do to help you. There's something wrong. And if you look in the history of popular constitutionalism, the first groups that are calling for the Bill of Rights to apply to the individual states are religious minority groups who feel this, this, um, this persecution and this harm uh, in their lived experience. They are not the constitutional scholars. They are the people whose experience says there's something wrong in this country if this can happen and there's no consequences. Okay, so kind of bringing this all together then. Was Joseph Smith right? Oh, sorry, sorry. I got to tell you how it ends. We never get to election day. At least Joseph Smith doesn't make it to election day. Um, by June of 1844, events uh, in Nauvoo and people determined to drive the, the Latter-day Saints out of the state altogether have, have occurred, and Joseph Smith finds himself in jail in the city of Carthage, Illinois, with his brother and a few close friends. And on June 27, 1844, a mob storms the jail and murders Joseph and Hiram Smith. Joseph Smith then gets the distinction nobody wants of being the first assassinated presidential candidate in American history. Now, there's, an, there's a caveat there. Joseph Smith was not killed because he was running for president. He was not killed to stop him from becoming president, but he was assassinated while running for president, uh, which makes him the first one with that distinction, and nobody wants that distinction. And so then, as we think about this in the big picture and, and what the big takeaways might be from this story, the story of a campaign that had little to no chance of succeeding, is to ask the question, was Joseph Smith right when he declared that the states' rights doctrines were what feed mobs? Was he right when he said that the states' rights doctrines provided a system that condoned religious persecution and in some instances empowered it? Let me give you one example that suggests that maybe he was. In 1854, long after the majority of Latter-day Saints have left the United States to follow Brigham Young to what became, again, the United States uh, here in Utah Territory, Senator David Acheson of Missouri wrote to Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, yes, that Jefferson Davis, about a new, quote-unquote, unwanted uh, political minority in the state of Missouri. And I should point out that Senator Acheson was one of the militiamen who, in 1838, carried out the governor of Missouri's order to expel the Latter-day Saints from the state. Now he is a sitting senator. And he writes to Jefferson Davis about uh, this new un unwanted group, the abolitionist. Missouri was a slave state. And in 1854, abolitionists were spilling over from Kansas and Nebraska, um, trying to end slavery in Missouri. And Senator Acheson tries to comfort Davis in telling him that they're going to take care of this. He doesn't need to worry. And this is what he writes in this letter. Quote, we are organizing to meet their organization. We will be compelled to shoot, burn, burn, 
and hang, but the thing will soon be over. We intend to Mormonize the abolitionist. Let, let that sink in. In 1854, a sitting United States senator used the word Mormon as a verb for burning, shooting, and hanging people they disagreed with politically. In 1838, the state had expelled an unwanted group through extra-legal violence, and they got away with it because of the state's rights doctrine. In 1854, they're ready to do it again because it had worked in 38. They're going to do it again in 1854. In this instance, at least, Joseph Smith was right that the state's rights doctrines were what fed mobs. So what does this, where does this bring us as we think about American discontent? The Latter-day Saints were discontent with the American political system because it seemed to empower and enable and condone violence against religious minorities. What does this incident, what does this long shot presidential bid by Joseph Smith tell us about the state of religious freedom in the United States at any given time? What do we mean when we talk about religious freedom and universal religious freedom in American history? Let me offer you a few of my thoughts here in closing. When we talk about the political obstacles to universal freedom in 19th century America, as well as in the present, we are not merely talking about a list of overtly discriminatory laws or attitudes or public policies or philosophies of governance. We are also talking about the way that Americans use seemingly neutral policies to enact and maintain discrimination against minority groups. Some do this out of ignorance, unaware of the way their political devotion is abridging the rights of some of their fellow citizens. There were some in the 19th century who promoted states' rights because they liked the idea, unaware of the negative effect it had and the discrimination it enacted against religious minority groups, in addition to upholding race-based slavery uh, in the United States at that time. So others uphold such policies to defend inaction as a way of claiming their hands are tied when they don't want to help a group that they believe would cause them political harm. Still others use such policies as the state's rights doctrine as a thin veil covering their prejudice against one religious minority group or another. Joseph Smith ran for president in 1844 because he recognized the problem. He fought religious bigotry, but he knew that the fight was against more than religious bigots. The fight was also against the systems of governance that empowered and ultimately protected such bigotry and such prejudice. Through his candidacy, Smith promoted the idea that as important as rooting out prejudice and misunderstanding was to the cause of universal religious freedom, Americans would never experience it in its true form until they could also address the flaws in their laws and government that maintained and promoted and empowered such systemic inequality. This was at the heart of Joseph Smith's discontent of his dissent in 1844 American politics. The political system needed to be reformed to, to work for all Americans, regardless of their faith and other identifying um, points of status. And for me and for us, I would argue that it then becomes incumbent on us to ask the same questions that perhaps these Americans should have been asking in 1844. Are there laws and policies that we support that on the surface say nothing of religion or race or other inequality, but in their implementation have a discriminatory effect? What is our obligation as citizens when we recognize that sometimes prejudice and discrimination of all types is built into the system itself. How do we address that? How do we correct that? These were pressing questions in 1844, and they are no less pressing to us today. And with that, I will end.